So now we're going to take a look at how we can sculpt a character head using a polysphere. I find this to be the best way to introduce ZBrush because it gives us a chance to look at the most common interface elements that we're going to be using. We can see how to load a tool and sculpt on that tool, as well as how to navigate, how to mask, how to change visibility, and how to use different brushes. So it's a really nice way to get a sort of holistic introduction to the tool set while actually doing something. So let's go ahead and get started. When you open ZBrush for the first time, you're going to see this menu here most likely. This is the light box. The light box is essentially a file browser that allows you to load any sort of file into ZBrush that can be saved out of ZBrush. So this is used to bring in projects, tools, brushes, materials, fibers, basically anything that you could save out of ZBrush you can load and say load in using the light box. In this case we're going to go to the tool panel of the light box. Now don't mistake this tool panel for this tool panel here. The main tool menu, this is a different beast here. We will be using this, but right now we're just in the light box tool menu. This is just looking on the hard drive where we've got tools saved in the ZBrush folder, and it's allowing us to bring in some generic Z tools. So we're going to load up this one here, the polysphere.ztl. We want to select this particular one. Don't grab onion skin. Don't grab the sphere 3D. Grab the polysphere ZTL right here. Double click it and you'll see suddenly it appears here in our main tool menu. If for some reason you don't see this tool menu on the side of your screen, go to the tool menu at the top of the screen here and just click this little radio button and it'll dock the tool panel on the side of the screen. So what we've just done is we've loaded this polysphere into ZBrush and we're ready to start working with it. So I'm going to close the light box by clicking the light box button. Now what we need to do is draw this tool onto the canvas and then go into edit mode. So I've got the polysphere as my active Z tool, so I'm going to click and drag and that draws it on the canvas. Now the first thing I need to do is immediately go to edit mode right here. If I do that, you'll see my cursor becomes red. I'm able to move around the sphere and sculpt on it. I can treat this like a piece of digital clay. It's what I expect it to be. However, a lot of times what happens is people draw the tool on the canvas and they keep drawing it. And what happens is you just get multiple copies of the same tool over and over again. So none of these can be rotated around. They can't be sculpted on. For all intents and purposes, this is essentially just an image on the document window. To get rid of these, if you find yourself with an image of your model stuck on screen at any time, press Control N. That clears your canvas. Now I'll draw the model again, and then I will press the edit button there to go into edit mode. Now a really good way of spotting if you're in edit mode is if your cursor is white or red. If your cursor is white, you are not in edit mode. If your cursor is red, you are in edit mode. So if I leave edit mode and then draw another tool, I'm going to have to clear the canvas. So I'll clear the canvas, draw my model again, because it's still there as my active tool, and then go to edit mode. The hotkey for edit mode, by the way, is the T key on your keyboard. So we've got a sphere on screen in edit mode. That means I can sculpt on it and I can move around it. The first thing that I'm going to want to do is I want to turn on X symmetry. So I'm going to come over here and I don't have to have the floor plane on to do this, but I'm going to turn on the floor plane just so I can see the orientation of the sphere a little bit better. It's kind of easier to spot the front and the sides if you've got that floor plane turned on. Now I'm going to press the X key on my keyboard. The X key turns on X symmetry. What that means is I'm going to be sculpting two sides of the model at the same time. That saves an enormous amount of time when you're working. So now I've got X symmetry turned on and I can tell because I've got the two little dots on either side of the model. Now if I want to navigate around the model, how would we do that? Uh, so I'm just going to make a little face on here so we can get some sense of direction. There we go. If I want to rotate, I simply just click and drag outside of the model. And you can see my cursor becomes a little circular arrow. That's my rotate button. If I want to tumble or dolly, I just hold down the Alt key and then click and drag my mouse. Now if I'm doing this on the mouse, it's the left mouse button generally. On my Wacom tablet, it's my lower button. That might be different depending on how you've got your keys mapped, but for the most part, it ends up being the lower button on your Wacom pen. 
Now, if I want to zoom, there's two ways to do this. I prefer this way. Hold down the Alt key, click and drag as if you were dollying, but then let go of the Alt key and you'll start to zoom. So this is going to take some muscle memory and some practice. You'll get it in about a day. It's all in the timing. It's Alt, click, let go of Alt, and drag. Alt, click, release Alt, and just drag up and down, and you'll zoom. Now, the alternative to that is to hold down the Control key and click and drag. Now, personally, I find it to be a little annoying to move my thumb back and forth between Alt and Control, because in ZBrush, you're always going to have your thumb on the Alt key, because as you're sculpting, if you need to subtract instead of add, you press the Alt key. So I find it just saves time and makes you a lot more efficient if you just learn to do the navigation that's built in around the Alt key, where you've already got your finger. So to recap, rotate is just click and drag off the model. Zoom is Alt, click, release Alt, and drag. And then dollying is Alt, click, and drag. Now it's important when you're working in ZBrush to be able to snap to an orthographic view. Now right now I am in orthographic, or I'm in perspective mode. If I turn the perspective button off here, you see perspective turns off. Now if I want to snap to an orthographic front view, ZBrush is not like Maya. You don't have an orthographic front side, top and bottom camera. You need to rotate your model and snap it to the view that you want. So if I want to see a dead-on front orthographic view of my face, I'll zoom in, start to rotate towards the front, and as I get towards the front, I will press and hold the shift key. And you see what happens is the model will snap to the closest orthographic view. Now I need to let go of my mouse cursor and then let go of shift. So you rotate towards the view you want to snap to, press shift, then let go of the tablet pen or the mouse, then let go of shift. If you don't do it in that order, if I start to rotate towards the top view, press shift, it'll snap to a top view. But if I let go of shift first, it'll just snap back to where it was. You need to make sure that you rotate towards the view you want to snap to. Press shift, let go of the mouse or the tablet pen, then let go of shift. Now, if you find yourself stuck, you can always come over here and use these buttons here, move, scale, and rotate. But I highly recommend you wean yourself off of these as soon as possible and use the keyboard and pen-based navigations. It'll make you much, much faster. So now we know how to load a model into ZBrush, how to go into edit mode, how to turn on our X symmetry, and how to navigate. Now let's take a look at how to actually sculpt. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to select a different brush. I want to select the move brush so I can start shaping this sphere into more of a head form. So I will press the B key to bring up the brush menu. I could also come over here and click the brush palette, but I find it's easier just to press B for brush. Because that way I can do this. If I know I want to use the move brush, I don't want to have to sit here and hunt through the alphabetically listed brushes to find move. If I know that I want a certain brush, I press B for brush, then M for move, and it immediately limits that huge brush menu down to just those brushes that begin with the letter M. And you can see there is the move brush. It is second to the last brush. And you'll notice that there's a little orange V. That's the hotkey that's associated with the move brush right now. So if I press the V key, I now have the move brush selected. So this is a very quick way of navigating through your brush system. If I press B for brush, S for standard, there's just the brushes that begin with the letter S, and you see standard is there, and the letter is associated with it is T. I could click it here to select it, or just press the T key, and there's my standard brush. So for move, remember it's B, M, V. Change my draw size, and then I'm just going to start shaping the sphere into more of a head form. I'm going to snap to a back view, snap to a top view, and that gives me the opportunity here to create that nice egg shape with the cranial mass, the facial mass. Very convenient. There, now I've got a nice generalized shape. Uh, I'll go into B for brush, S for standard, and we'll select the standard brush. Now let's say I want to carve away some eye sockets here. Now remember, 
your brushes default to Z add. They're going to add as you sculpt. However, if you were to come up here and turn on Z sub, they'll subtract. I don't use this button here. I always keep my brush on Z add because no matter what, as I'm sculpting, if I press the alt key, it'll just naturally subtract. So I don't ever have to come up here and change these. Just leave it on Z add and press the alt key when you want to subtract. There we go. Now, if I want to smooth, press the shift key and you'll notice that my brush turns blue. And now I can smooth back the shapes that I've made. So I'm going to select a different material now. I don't actually want to work on this red material. I'm going to come over here to these palettes on the side of the screen. These buttons are all palettes. If you click on a palette in ZBrush, it opens up a selection of items that you can pick from, just like an artist's palette of colors. The artist has various colors on the palette that they pick. Well, here I've got various brushes on my palette, various strokes on my stroke palette, various alphas to change the shape of my brush on my alpha palette. What I want to do is select a different material from my material palette. So I'll open my material palette here and I will grab basic material too. And that just gives me a nice gray shaded material here to work with. Now I'm going to select a different brush. I'm going to go to B for brush, C for clay, and I want to select the clay tubes brush. And the clay tubes brush I particularly like because it's a nice organic brush. It builds up shapes in a really aggressive, quick way, and it feels a lot like organic clay. My background was originally as a clay sculptor and uh, makeup effects, so I really like the way this brush treats the surface. It just gives me that nice, noisy, living feeling. It really feels like a surface that's, that's live and in process and being worked, and I like that quality. So this is a brush that I tend to use a lot. It also builds up really aggressively, so if I want to build up the forms of the the brow here, I can do that. Bring the nasal bone down, build up the mound of the mouth there. Just a really nice brush. I really, really like working with this brush. And remember, if I want to go back to the move brush, B for brush, M for move, V, and now I can start changing the shape of the head again using the move brush. Now remember, if I want to smooth, I can press the shift key and then I can smooth things back. Now notice how aggressive that smooth brush is. I want to change the intensity of my smooth brush. So what I will do is I will press the shift key and then up here there's my Z intensity. If I turn Z intensity down it will change the intensity of that brush. So if I turn this down my smooth brush is no longer as strong. Now watch if I let go of the shift key it bounces back to its original setting for the move brush. If I go to the clay tubes brush, it has a different one for the clay tubes brush. So the Z intensity is going to be different per brush. So if I were to change this now, dial this back, my clay tubes brush is now not as intense. And that's quite useful to me. I actually like my brushes to be turned down a little bit on Z intensity. And when I'm making these changes up here to my intensity, you'll notice that I want to change my brush sizes. There's a draw size slider here that allows me to change the size of my brush. And there's a focal shift slider that allows me to change the fall off. Those sliders are up here, but I very rarely come up here to change them. I use the space bar to bring this menu up here. The space bar gives me access to my draw size, my focal shift, my Z intensity, as well as RGB intensity if I'm painting as well as various other things that we're going to be talking about in later chapters. So it's a really, really useful menu to have access to right at your fingertips there. So I spend most of my time selecting things from the spacebar menu here if I need to adjust my brushes.
Now, as I'm working, if I want to save the tool that I'm working on, I will come to the tool menu here, and I will go to Tool, Save As, and then I can save the tool that I'm working on. I can also go to File, Save As, and that will save a project. If I use File Save As, which is the default when I press Control S, that's going to save a project. That will save everything that's currently open in ZBrush. If I go to Tool Save As, it will only save the tool that I'm currently working on. So as a new user to ZBrush, I would recommend saving with File Save As, because that will save everything that you're currently working on. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. I'll just go to File, Save As, and I'll save my work here. Now something important to understand when you're working with a tool in ZBrush is that it has multiple subdivision levels most of the time. Uh, ZBrush is famous for bringing tools in or bringing models in, subdividing them up, and then adding detail. So this Z-sphere, or this polysphere here, actually has multiple subdivisions. So if I go to the tool menu, open up geometry, you'll see that it's got multiple subdivision levels here. So anything that you bring into ZBrush is going to be a polygon model. And what ZBrush will do is it will divide that model, adding subdivisions. And the more subdivisions you add, the more detail you can sculpt. So if I step down to level 1, you can see that this is only a 24,000 polygon model. If I were to step up another subdivision level, it multiplies the total amount by 4. If I step it up again, I get 24,000. So there's 1,000. 500, 6,000, 14, 146, I mean, then 24,578. So my active points here represent the total number of polygons available at the subdivision level that I'm on, and the total points are the total points in the model at its highest subdivision level. So what this means is, if I want to make big shape changes to the model, what I tend to do is step down my subdivision levels, and you see I just did that with a hotkey. Shift-D steps down your subdivisions. D will step up. So I will step down with Shift-D. I'm on my Move Brush, so I will use the Move Brush just to make big shape changes to the skull. And I tend to make big changes like this down at the lower subdivision levels because if I make it a higher subdivision level, then I'm dealing with thousands of polygons I don't need to mess with. If I'm just going to make a big form change, I'll do it down here at the lower subdivision levels. That way, when I step back up my subdivisions with D hotkey, the shape follows along. If I want to make changes to the jawline here, I would step down my subdivisions, make the changes to the jawline, and then step back up, and those changes follow along. So I'll go back to my clay tubes brush here and do a little bit more sculpting. Just create the basic forms of the mouth there, and let's start to look at making a nose. So I'll use my clay tubes brush just to rough in the nose shape here. And then I'll go to my standard brush, and I'll start to sketch in some nostrils. And you can see how it's very faceted. You can really see the individual polygons there, and that's going to be a problem. It's not giving me the, the level of detail that I'm going to want. So what I need to do here is add a subdivision level. Now you add a subdivision level at the highest subdivision level. So I can't add one from level 2 because there's another one above it. So I'll go to level 3 where there is no more subdivisions above it, and then I will press either the divide button here, or I will press Control D. I'm going to add a subdivision level with the hotkey now, Control D. So watch what happens. This number will increase, which means I now have four subdivision levels. You'll also see that the model got a little bit smoother. This allows me to come in and make more detailed shapes here. So I can start to really tweak the shapes of those nostrils there. Maybe I want to come in here and create some lips. So I'll just start to carve out the shape between the lips. And you can see that it, it's actually still a little bit too jagged. I don't have enough detail in the mouth area to make the shapes that I want to make. So I'm going to add another subdivision level. Now, 
as you're working in ZBrush, be careful. Don't just add a bunch of subdivision levels like that and start sculpting, because then you're going to carry around a whole lot more geometry than you need. I'm at 6 million polygons now, and I don't need that at all. So I'm going to step back down to level 4. I'm going to add one more subdivision level, and that just gives me 393,000 polygons. Now I've got enough that I can come in here and make the shapes of the lips in the most generalized way. I'm still going to need to add more detail to finish the lips, but I'm just trying to make the most general shapes. And a big tip I can give you as you're learning ZBrush is always make the shapes that you're trying to make at the lowest possible subdivision level that will support that shape. That's going to keep you from getting that sort of lumpy beginner ZBrush model look. A lot of beginners when they're using ZBrush create what look like very lumpy models. And the reason for that is is that they're using too much geometry to make the shapes they're trying to make. And that's a, a very common error. You don't need millions of polygons to make a nose. And if you've got millions of polygons there, it's actually going to make it harder for you to create the shape that you're trying to make. There we go. I want to go back to my clay tubes brush and just start to plane those shapes out a little bit in the nose. Smooth that back. So if we're going to be doing things like the nose and the mouth, we're really going to need to understand how to do masking. Now what masking does is it protects some areas of the model from sculpting. So for example, if I step up to my highest subdivision level and I create a mask, I hold down the control key and I'll just paint an area with a mask. Now that's going to protect that area from being sculpted. So if I were to sculpt around it, the unmasked areas get impacted, the masked area does not. If I want to subtract from the mask, I'll hold down control like I'm going to be painting a mask. Then I'll hold down Alt, and you see how it now says minus mask? I can now subtract from my mask. If I want to invert my mask, I will control click on the background. If I want to remove my mask entirely, I will control click and drag, making this little marquee off the model, and that will clear the mask. So masks are extremely valuable when you're sculpting. I don't think it's possible to do a sculpture with any level of nuance or detail without being able to use masks in ZBrush. And I'll show you how we do that. If I come in here and mask out my upper lip, that allows me to come in and start sculpting the lower lip. I can use the inflate brush and it's only going to impact the lower lip area. I can use my move brush. I can pull that lower lip out a little bit. I can now control click on the background and that will invert that mask. And now I can take my move brush, I can bring that upper lip out a bit. Oops. I can smooth that geometry a little bit. Now if I want to soften the edge of a mask, if it's too sharp, I can control click on the masked area and you see how it feathers the edge. That allows me to soften the edges like that. If I want to sharpen the edge, I control alt click and that sharpens my mask. And your mask is only going to become as sharp as the subdivision level that you're on. So if I don't have a lot of geometry here, I'm only going to be able to make the mask so soft or so sharp. The more subdivisions you have, the more geometry that's there, the sharper you can make your mask. So I'm going to go ahead and isolate the upper lip and I'm going to use B for brush, I for inflate, and I'm going to select the inflate brush here and just do some inflating of that upper lip. There we go. So you can see how you can use masking to isolate areas and then work into specific shapes. We can do the same thing here on the nose. I'll mask out the area of the nostrils that I want to work on. I'll invert the mask 
and then I will control click on the masked area to feather the edge. I'll do that a couple of times. I will select my inflate brush and I'll just inflate the edges of the nostrils there and you see that creates a nice sort of crease there like you might see at the wings of the nostrils. There we go. Holding down the Alt key so I can carve away with my brush, just like so. I'll take my Move brush, mask out the central portion of the nose here to protect that so my brush won't impact it. And then I can use the Move brush to sort of shift these parts of the nose in if I want to change the shape of my nose. I'm going to step down a few subdivision levels here, use my move brush just to bring the bone structure of the face forward a bit. I feel like that's really suffering from uh, some anatomical inaccuracy there. I think that needs to come forward. It is fantasy anatomy, but we can base it in some realism to help the character feel more believable. There we go. So I'm making these changes way down at a lower subdivision level build up the cranial masses back here a little bit more. We're not going to do a full bust, we're just sketching out a head, but we'll do this down at the lower subdivision levels, then we step up and those changes follow all the way up to the top. B for brush, M for move, V to select the move brush, then we can change that shape. You can see that you can very quickly move between your brush selections using that that uh, B brush, that B hotkey. So I just selected the clay tubes brush with B for brush, C for clay, T for clay tubes. I can start to sculpt in the nasal labial fold there. So I'm going to use my masking again. I'm going to mask out the wing of the nostril. I'm going to mask out where the nasal labial fold will go. That's the little crease that runs next from the nostril down to the corners of your mouth. And I'm just going to sculpt up to that mask. Do a bit of smoothing, sculpt up to that mask, do a bit of smoothing. I can even come along here with the inflate brush. With the inflate brush, I just will brush right up to that mask. Control click, I can invert the mask and I can do some smoothing here. And create a nice realistic looking crease there. There you go. Now, here we've got the alpha palette, and you see that the clay tubes brush actually has this alpha associated with it, this white square. What this does is it gives me that surface quality on the brush, that noisy surface quality. It changes the tip of the brush. If I turn this off, it'll change the tip of the brush. It'll make it more subtle. And that's something that I actually do quite often when I'm working with the clay tubes brush, is I will turn the alpha off, and that gives me a more subtle brush, just like so. Mask out those lips there and just push that little bit in. Build up the chin. I find this to be a really effective way of sculpting kind of organic forms to use the clay tubes brush with the alpha turned off. If I want to sculpt some finer creases, I'll take the standard brush, B for brush, S for standard, T. And then I'm going to take the alpha menu, the alpha palette, and I'll select alpha 01. That's a little rounded dot there. And what that does, just like Photoshop, changes the shape of the tip of my brush. So I'm holding down the Alt key, and this gives me a nice, fine kind of a, a wrinkle brush. So I'll use this a lot to sort of sketch in wrinkles.
You see that gives me a nice, sharp edge to my brush. So don't be afraid of going in and experimenting with different alphas. There's quite a few here you can play with, and any grayscale image you can bring into ZBrush you can use as a brush shape. We've got a whole chapter dedicated just to the alpha palette, so don't worry about the fact that it looks like there's a lot more going on in this palette. We're definitely going to get to it, but for right now, all you need to know is the alphas are used to change the shape of your brush tip. So if you understand that much, you're going to be really far along in customizing your own brushes. build up that nasal bridge there. Now I'm going to save my work again. I will go to File, Save As, and I will save my project. Now I'd like to take a look at how to add eyeballs to this model. What we want to do is we want to have a separate pair of eyeballs that sit inside of this model. To do that, we're going to use something called subtools. And I'm going to open the light box here and just grab a different demonstration model. I'm going to double click the demo soldier here. And this is also going to illustrate an interesting point. If you watch, when I double click this model, the head that we've been working on will be replaced. It'll be replaced by the model that I'm double clicking on, the demo soldier. However, the head is not gone. You see right now, it's still in the tool palette. What's basically happened here is my active subtool or my active Z tool has been changed to the demo soldier. However, the head that we've been working on is still there. So it's just important to note that when you're working in ZBrush, you can have multiple tools sitting here in memory. Whichever one is sitting right here in the main tool palette, that is your active Z tool. So I'm just opening up the demo soldier because I want to illustrate subtools. This is a Z tool that is composed of multiple subtools. There is the body, which is the one we're currently working on. There's also the shirt, the belt, the knee pads, the boots, the wristbands, the glove, the goggles. If I go to the subtool menu here, you can see there's a whole selection of subtools. Each subtool is an individual Z tool that has its own texture, its own subdivision levels, its own, its own material settings, self-contained. So basically, subtools allow you to take multiple Z-tools and stack them together and orient them to each other. So this is how you create a character that's got costume elements or eyeballs or different parts of its body or armor, things that are grouped together so they move together. And if I select different subtools here, I can sculpt and work on them independently. And a quick way you can move between subtools is if you alt-click on them. So if I want to alt-click on the goggles here, I can now be working just on the goggles. If I alt-click on the shirt, I am now working just on the shirt. Here are the straps, just the straps. Knee pads, the same. So basically what I wanted to illustrate was how subtools work here, that they're stacked up in the subtool menu and each one is its own Z tool. So for example, here we've got the body. The body has three subdivision levels. If I alt click on the shirt, you can see the shirt is now my active subtool and it only has two subdivision levels. You can tell which one is active because it takes on a lighter tone when you click on it. If you alt click, if I want to hide all the subtools except for the one that I'm working on, I just click the solo button. Turn off solo, and I'll see the whole model again. In my subtool palette, you see that I've got these little eyeballs here. If I click that eyeball, all the other tools, their visibility turns off. This allows me to selectively turn visibility on just for different subtools. So whereas solo just arbitrarily hides everything except for your currently active tool, the eyeballs here allow me to selectively turn on visibility for just a set of subtools. If I want to show everything again, I just turn my main eyeball on here and everything else comes on. So now let's go back to our head. What I want to do is I want to create a subtool for a pair of eyeballs. If we have separate polygon eyeballs, that allows us to sculpt the eyelids around them and just get a really nice realistic looking eye. So to do that, I am going to go to the lightbox menu here and I'm going to load a new polysphere. 
double click that polysphere. Now you see my head is still there but I have loaded a new polysphere. The reason for that is if I want to append a new subtool into a model it needs to be here in my tool palette. So I'll just select my head again. There's the polysphere that we loaded in. Now I can come down here to my subtool palette, click append, and then select the polysphere. You see the polysphere is now there in my subtool stack. If I select it, it is now my active subtool. You can see that it's got a little dark stripe underneath it that shows me that it's active. Now that sphere is probably sitting inside the head. If I turn on transparency, it will allow me to see through my subtools to what's inside. So there that sphere is. It's sitting inside the head. What I need to do now is I need to move and scale that sphere so it is the size of an eyeball and it's sitting in the eyeball eye socket and the head. We do that using these tools here, the transpose tools. Transpose allows us to move, scale, and rotate subtools in relation to each other. So for example, if I come over here to back to the um, demo soldier, and if I go to move, draw a transpose move line, I can click and drag and then move that shoulder pad away from the body. If I select maybe the torso or the, uh, the shirt here, I can select rotate and I can rotate the shirt and then move it away from the body. Basically, Transpose allows me to rotate, scale, and move different subtools in relation to each other. So coming back to the head, I turn on transparency again so I can see that sphere inside. I want to move the sphere off to the side, so I'm going to select Transpose Move. Now Transpose Move gives me a gizmo that looks like this. It gives me a handle, this Transpose line. What I will do is I will click on the model that I want to move and I will drag that line out. Now I can constrain that line to different axes by clicking these color-coded bars here. If I click the red one, that will constrain it to the x-axis. If I click green, it will constrain it to the y-axis. If I move it off-center here, I can now do it to the z-axis. I need to move it in x. So I'm going to use the transpose move. When I'm in transpose move mode, click inside the center circle and drag, and that will move the object. Don't do the outer circle, that'll squash it. Don't do the inner circle, that will clip it. As you can see there, that's something that we're going to use when we do hard surface modeling. When you're transpose moving an object, use the center circle. If you click on the circle itself, you're just going to move the line. If you click inside the circle, you will move the object. So now I want to transpose scale, so I'll go to scale mode. I'll click in the center of the, of the sphere and then drag a new line out. Now for scale and rotate, I will always use the outer circle. If I use the inner circle, it's not going to do anything but shear the object. If I use the outer circle, it will scale around the point of the inner circle. So I can now scale that eyeball down. If I drag and then cross over the center, it'll just reverse and start scaling up again. So you need to basically click and drag multiple times to scale the eyeball down. I'll now go back to move, click inside the center circle and then move that eyeball there, snap to a side view, remember you snap by rotating and then pressing shift once you get towards your orthographic view. I'll draw a new transpose line and then I'll click that center circle and pull it forward. So basically I'm just trying to get that eyeball positioned and scaled to the right size. There we go. So I'm pretty happy with the placement of that eyeball. I'm going to turn off transparency. So now what I want to do is I actually want to clone it over. I'm actually going to scoot it over just one more a little bit. There we go. I want to copy it over to the other side because I've only got one eyeball right now. So what I will do is I will go to Z plugin. I will go to Subtool Master and there's a button here called Mirror. These buttons are just different options that I can use to affect all of my subtools. Uh, I can use mirror, I can fill them with different colors and materials. There's several different options here, but the one we want to use is mirror. So I'll press mirror and it'll bring up this menu. And I'm just going to leave the default settings. I'm going to merge both eyeballs into one subtool so I don't end up with two separate eyeball subtools. And I'm going to mirror it across the X axis. Click OK, and there we go. I now have a subtool that are two eyeballs. Now, because my eyeball subtools are the active subtool right now, that's the one I'm sculpting on. So I'm going to select the head, and I'm going to turn on my transparency. What I want to do now is I want to sculpt eyeballs around, or eyelids around those eyeballs. 
I turned on transparency here so I can see through the eyes and sculpt what's behind them. I'm going to select my clay tubes brush and I'm going to start filling in the eye sockets. Basically, I'm just sculpting and pulling all those faces forward until they're sitting in front of the eyeball. Okay? So you see that what I basically did was I just sculpted into the eye socket area, pulling all those faces that were behind the eyeballs forward so they're now sitting in front. So if I turn off transparency, you'll see, oops, if I turn off transparency, you'll see that the, the faces of the, of the bust are sitting in front of the eyeball. The eyeballs are now inside the head. The reason I want to do that is I want to use these faces to create my eyelids. So I'm just going to use my clay tubes brush just to fill in those real deep areas there. I don't need those. I'm going to use my masking brush. Remember, masking is holding down the control key. I'm going to mask out the shape of an open eye. Make sure that I step up to my highest subdivision level because your, your mask is only going to be as nice as the resolution of your model. If your model is really low res, it's not going to look like a nice mask. There we go. Just masking out that shape, doing the little medial canthus there, the little tear duct. That looks good. Now I'll invert the mask. So basically I have unmasked the area of the open eye. I'll take the move brush now, B for brush, M for move, V. Turn my draw size up. Now remember how I said if you use the Alt key, your brush will always subtract? Well, you can't really subtract with a move brush, but if you hold the Alt key while you're using it, it actually does this really interesting thing where it pushes and pulls along the axis of the normal you click on. So what I will do is I will hold down the Alt key and then just click to push those faces directly in. Now look at what I get. I get eyelids now. I'm going to clear my mask, use my move brush, and I'm just going to start shaping this geometry. Smooth it a bit, and I can pull these eyelids over the eye. Here I will use my mask on the lower eyelid. Pull the upper lid forward and down. Give me a nice crease there. There we go. So that very quickly and very easily gives us eyelids. I'll use my clay tubes brush just to start to build up sort of the fatty, soft tissues of the eyelids. Maybe some bags under the eyes there. You can mask that area out, invert the mask, use the inflate brush, create a little bit of a inflated sort of pucker down there so it feels like it's fatty tissues. Fleshiness there in the eye. There we go. Now as I'm working, if I want to see my model in perspective, because we've been spending most of our time in orthographic mode, if I press the P key, it will turn perspective mode on. You just see that gives me a little bit of camera distortion there. If I want to adjust those settings, I can go to the draw menu, and my angle of view from my perspective camera is there, as well as align to object. So I'm just going to use my clay tubes brush to fill out a little bit of space here. Build up the temporal ridge of the skull. Just continue to work into that character's, body, character's head. I want to create a little ear shape here. I'm just going to make it a really small little strange alien ear. I'm going to mask out the shape of the ear here. Invert that mask. And then I'm just going to use the move brush. I'll pull that ear shape away from the head, just like so smooth the front portion, invert my mask, and then I'll just pull this back so it gives me some draft behind the ear. I can clear my mask and just do a little bit of smoothing there.
I'm basically just trying to sculpt a, an interesting ear shape here. I'll mask out the earlobe. And that gives me an opportunity to use my inflate brush and then inflate the earlobe down without impacting the geometry that's next to it. So we can give us a nice sort of droopy earlobe there. When I'm creating nice sharp creases on a model, a brush that I really like to use is called the Dam Standard or Damien Standard brush. And that's B for brush, D for dam, and right there, Dam Standard. And it's really nice for creating creases. Uh, it's a bit strong in its default form, so I'm going to turn the Z intensity down. And I'll just use this to start to sort of sketch in brow wrinkles. Now, brow wrinkles and things like this, you don't necessarily want them to be symmetrical. So I'll probably turn my symmetry off at this point just to create some nice asymmetrical wrinkles in the forehead here. And once I get away from the center line of the head, there's not too much harm in turning your symmetry back on. But generally when I'm doing design work or I'm doing work um, on characters, I will try and turn my symmetry off um, well before I'm done with the model. And the reason for that is if you've got your symmetry turned on all the way to the end, it starts to look fake. Uh, the human brain picks up on symmetry really easily, so you just want to be really careful that you don't always have your symmetry turned on and um, you're always sculpting with X symmetry on because it starts to create really um, generic symmetrical forms that are pretty easy to spot. You might not necessarily know exactly what's going wrong, but your brain will pick up on something. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll go in near the end and start to break symmetry. I'll turn off my symmetry and go in with the move brush and shift things around, make one eyelid a little bit more closed than another, etc, etc. So I'm just coming in here to play around with that little corner of the eye there. Going in with my inflate brush, B for brush, I for inflate. Select the inflate brush and I'm going to mask out the inside of that to create that little tear duct there. It's called the medial canthus of the eye. I'm just going to inflate that smooth, inflate smooth, and create that nice little membrane in there. Then I will invert the mask. Oops. I will invert the mask and then use my move brush just to sort of tuck the shape around. Create some nice detail there. There we go. Those hotkey combinations become really second nature to you as well. So you'll be able to really quickly go from, you know, the B brush ST for standard or BMV for move, and you're not going to think about it. You can also hotkey specific brushes to keys on your keyboard, which is something we will talk about in a later chapter on customization. It's something that I make use of uh, when I work. I'm a big believer in hotkeys. I feel like they make you much faster at ZBrush when you're working. And the faster you are, the more confident and efficient you can be, and then the more opportunities you have to do more work. Here we go. Just using the standard brush to create some little ridges here, some interesting little shapes. I'll change my draw size or my brush down to a smaller alpha. See, this creates a finer little bump. I'm going to use my masking here to mask out the inside of that eye 
and that way I can bring the brows down. I can adjust some of those shapes around the eye, create more of a compression here. Maybe I want to give it a little bit more of an aggressive look. I can do that now without having to worry about impacting all the sculpting that I did on the eye area. I can control click to feather that mask. Maybe I want to release a bit of that mask there. Bring that forward. And I will save my work. So now we've seen how we can sculpt a character from a polysphere and add eyeballs as subtools. So we've seen how to sculpt a very, you know, loose representation of a character head from a very simple building block, in this case a polysphere in ZBrush. We've seen how to do masking with the control key. Uh, we've looked at how to subtract from masks, how to sharpen and soften them and clear them. We've seen how to uh, select our brushes using the brush quick selection menu. B for brush, the first letter of your brush, and then the hotkey for that brush. We've looked at how to smooth by pressing the shift key. We've looked at how to change our draw size and our Z intensity using the spacebar menu. We've looked at navigation, clicking and dragging on the background to rotate. Alt, click and drag to dolly, and then Alt, click, drag, and release Alt to zoom. We've looked at how to save project files from our work. And we've looked at some of the general menus that we're going to be using often when we're inside of ZBrush. So this is sort of a generalized overview, just sculpting a character bust. I've been teaching ZBrush for several years now, and this is usually how I introduce the program. This gives us a chance to see everything in action before we zero in and start to really focus on specific tools and specific workflows. So I hope you found this useful. Uh, this particular lecture has a file associated with it which contains the hotkeys that we talked about as well as some notes that I think you'll find helpful uh, so you can find that for this lecture um, and now let's go ahead move on to the next chapter and start to really dive into some of the specifics of ZBrush